he is my buddy, Kurt Warner, from NFL Game Day Morning, Pro Football uh, Hall of Fame, as well as Westwood One Radio. How are you, sir? I'm good, buddy. How are you? I am doing fine. I'll give you the floor. Because, I, I, I mean, when, when, when I saw Tua come in the game against the Jets for that cup of coffee on Sunday, Kurt, and I saw Ryan Fitzpatrick, you know, raising his arms uh, like the Night King to try and get the fans all excited um, and hyped up for Tua, um, I thought to myself when Tua got named the starter, maybe they knew it at the time. And Ryan was just like, okay, this is it, and reveling in the moment. And I felt really stupid when I heard how gutted Ryan Fitzpatrick was, and then I read your tweet. So I'll give you the floor on, on this, um, this very sensitive subject matter, quite frankly, Kurt. Yeah, um, you know, and I've heard a lot of people, you know, say a lot of different things about, you know, Miami being 3-3 three and three and they're not in a great situation and there's a bye and, you know, everybody should have known this was coming. And, you know, all that stuff is valid. Uh, you know, I think the point is simply that, no matter when it happens, no matter what the situation, um, when you feel like you're playing good football um, and somebody makes this, this move like this, it hurts. I mean, we're all competitors. We all want to play. And then maybe fast forward a little bit because you heard Ryan talk a little bit um, you know, after the decision was made that he doesn't know if this is a, that was his last start in the NFL. He doesn't know how much more he's going to play. And so then it's even heavier because – not only do you realize, you know, that the team's going in a different direction, but you're starting to think about your longevity. And, and if this was the last game, you never really got to prepare for this being my last game. You know, for a guy like myself, I knew I was going to retire. I knew when my last game was going to be played. But, you know, for a guy that doesn't know that and all of a sudden, bang, he's out of a game and he realized, oh, shoot, that might be the last time I play in the National Football League. I think there's so many things that are heavy about that. And, you know, and he also talks, too, about why well, I've been benched many times, and that's one of the arguments that a lot of people will say with Fitz as well. You know, he's had plenty of opportunities, and he didn't take full advantage of them. So, you know, why should they stick with him here? But I really believe Ryan was saying, I'm playing some of the best football I've ever played, and our team is winning and being successful why now? You know, this is what, uh, one time where I didn't expect it. When you're not playing well and you've got a young guy behind you, you get it when they go, okay, we're just going to go to the young guy. That's an easy move. When you're playing well, you never fully understand why. And, you know, when I was in New York and went through this, I give so much credit to Tom Coughlin. When, when he brought me into that room to tell me that they were going to Eli, I think a lot of people in this business – uh, they'll bring you in and they'll point to reasons why you're not going to be the starter. Well, you didn't do this well enough or you didn't do that well enough or the team's not what, whatever. When Tom Coughlin brought me in, he actually looked at me and said, Kurt, you're the reason that, you know, we're, we're a playoff team in this moment. You're a reason why we started this season five and two. You don't deserve this. This isn't fair. But I feel this is the best move for this organization moving forward. And I have 100% respect for that man because he looked me in the eye and told me, sometimes this is how the NFL works. It's not fair. And, it, you know, it's not right by a lot of different standards. But sometimes it's the right decision moving forward. And what I think, you know, Coach Coughlin was saying was, yes, we're a playoff team in this moment. But we're not a very good football team quite yet. We've made some strides. The year before, we were 4-12. and 12. You know, like I said, we started 5-2, and two, so we were showing some signs. But I think he realized this team is not ready to compete for a championship yet. But we have pieces that will be able to help us compete for a championship at some point. And Kurt's not the guy. He's not going to be here long enough to be the guy that leads us to a championship. That guy is going to have to be Eli. So because the team's not quite ready, but we're going to get there, I need to put my young quarterback in so when the team is ready to compete for a championship, my quarterback is ready to compete for a championship. And we all know what happened in New York, that he got ready and he led them to two championships, and that worked out perfectly. I believe that's the same thing that's happened in Miami, is that they're playing some, some good football right now. They're coming together as a team. They're a young team. I don't think anybody thinks they're going to compete this year. And so the idea is, well, Ryan, you're playing well, but you're not going to be that guy that's going to lead us in years to come. That guy will be Tua. So let's get him in and get him ready, and he might have to go through his lumps like Eli Manning did. 
But we believe in the long run, when this team is built to win a championship and compete, our quarterback will be ready to do the same thing. And now we actually have a chance to win championships very much like the Giants did. And, but here's the deal, Kurt, too, and this is another piece of insight I'd love to get from you here, is that uh, when you were 5-2 and two then, just in obviously Miami 3-3 three and three now, there is still the business of, well, you never know, right? So we need to continue to win, and obviously for everyone else in the locker room who does think a 5-2 and yep. two start back then or a 3-3 three and three start now is the building block to win right here, right now. And we saw what happened to Dak. We see that any snap of the football means the backup is in. How did you deal with the fact that, okay, you might still have to play here and you still now have to get your, your the, the, the team ready uh, and yourself ready as well as you're expected to be the professional in the quarterback room for the young kid that just got in there? What is Ryan Fitzpatrick thinking right now? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, and I always say this is that every time I sign on the dotted line to be a part of a team, I never signed or there was no fine print that said, well, you just have to be a good teammate and do what's best for the team when you're the starter. I signed on the dotted line to say I'm a part of this team and whatever this team needs me to do, I have to do it to the best of my ability, regardless of whether I like the role that I'm in or not. So I start with that because I remember, you know, when I was with the Giants, there were times that we would take, you know, train trips like to Philly. And I remember sitting on the train and hanging with some of the veteran guys and hearing them grumble about that exact thing is we're a playoff team right now. Why are we making this change right now? Who knows what this season could bring? Who knows what we could be by the end of the year? And if we get into the playoffs and we've seen that numerous times, I mean, it happened with the Giants. They got into the wild card team and went all the way to win a championship. You know, same thing happened when we weren't a very good team in Arizona and we almost won a championship. So I understood the idea that, hey, you never know what happens come playoff time. And so there was some grumbling and some veteran guys going, man, we don't get very many shots at this. And right now we're competitive. Why are we making this move? So one of the roles that I had was to have to be an extension of Coach Coughlin into the locker room to make sure guys bought into what this decision was and that I couldn't allow it to divide the locker room. It would have been easy for me to go, yeah, you're right. I don't understand it. Why, you know, does this have to happen? Because we're – and feed that. But it became a big role of mine to diffuse that and to let people know that, hey, this is the reason they're mm-hmm. doing this, and this is the key. And, yes, it might suck for me or it might suck for our team right now, but in the long run we believe it's going to pay bigger dividends. Another example is, as you said, have to go in and play. I think it was maybe the second game that Eli played in his career. We played up uh, in Baltimore against that great Baltimore defense. And, you know, it was probably the worst quarterback performance I've ever seen in the NFL. Eli was, you know, out of sorts. He was overwhelmed. Guys were walking around. He couldn't really figure out what he was doing and just struggled all day long. They put me in at the end of that game. At the end of the game, you know, I drove us down. We scored a couple touchdowns in the last quarter and, you know, was kind of picking apart this defense. And it was another moment where you could see everybody on the sideline go, see, this is why we shouldn't have gone to the young guy. I had to go to Coach Coughlin as soon as that game was over, and I said, Coach, first thing you have to say in your press conference is Eli is our starter, will be starting next week, and will be our starter moving forward. You have to make that announcement to the guys to let them know, forget about what happened here. This was a growing pain for a young guy that we needed to take out so we didn't beat him up too much, but he's going back in. He is going to learn from this and grow, and we are going to rally around this guy. And it was vital for him to make that statement early because the longer that happens where, oh, I see what Kurt did and we saw what Eli did, the harder it was going to be to continue to gain that locker room back and prove that this was the right decision. And so you have to be able to facilitate some of that, even in a role that you don't want, even in a backup position, even when you feel you're the better player at that particular time, You have to jump into ranks and go, okay, what is my role here now that I've been pushed into a backup spot? And, you know, there's always two ways to go, and we've heard many, you know, organizations and many quarterback rooms where, you know, the one guy won't help the other guy or the one guy divides the locker room. Uh, I think Fitz's role now is to continue to be an extension of the coaching staff and continue to convince that locker room why this move was made and why it was the best move 
moving forward, even if you're not a part of that, which I know can be very difficult, but to me that's the role that he has to play and the key role to have a team um, you know, that's going to move forward and be able to grow from a situation like this. I can't. I mean, Kurt, man, I've been around you a long time, and I know who you are, and I know who you are with your, your family, your wife, your awesome wife. Uh, so I know who you are, um, but uh, I did not know you did that um, by, you know, going to Coughlin and saying what you said because you didn't know the Cardinals and what was happening with the Cardinals that got you basically uh, into the Hall of Fame because you did what you did in St. Louis damn near again. You didn't know that was a possibility for you when you went to Coughlin after that game under those circumstances. How tough was that? For you. Yeah, you know, that was, that was hard because you're right. I mean, I was in a position and, you know, the first thing is I knew my, you know, the extension of my career was not going to happen in New York. If I was going to be a starter somewhere, first of all, I knew it wasn't going to be in New York. I knew they drafted Eli and he was going to be the future. No matter how long I stayed there, my career was not going to finish out as a New York Giant. So I knew that first and foremost. Uh, and so, you know, they're really, I mean, I could have fought it as much as I wanted, but I knew that was a reality. But you're right. The second part was I was playing that year. I was hoping to get 16 games that year to parlay that into another opportunity, knowing that Eli would end up taking over, and I hoped I could hold that off for, for an entire year. Um, but you're right. I didn't know what the future was. I didn't know if I would have another opportunity. But, again, Rich, the bottom line is you have to take the situation you're in and you have to figure out what your role is and what's the best, uh, you know, the best way that you can handle where you're at now. I couldn't sit there and selfishly go, well, I'm going to try to continue to fight for me because I don't know what my future is, and I've got to make sure I get a future. Again, my was to be the best teammate, the best New York Giant that I could be, and I had to navigate what that looked like, and that was how I navigated. That's what I believed was my best role and what I could do that was best for the team in that particular moment and had to believe that somehow, some way, um, what I did it, done in those nine games or somebody would be willing to give me a shot. And I'm grateful that the Cardinals did. And as you said, I was able to write the end of, of my book, um, yeah. you know, on my own terms. Um, but, yeah, no, I didn't know that. And like I said, Fitz doesn't know that, doesn't know what the future is, doesn't know what, if he's going to play another game. And that's, that's part of it. But, um, you know, but, but it's, it's part of the role and, and the situation that you're in. And for me, that was the way I navigated it to say this is the best thing I can do for the Giants. I've got to put my ego and myself aside and do what's best for this team. You know, and I also looked at it grateful that they gave me nine games, that they brought me in and gave me an opportunity to play and at least get back on the map. And it was that nine games that got me an opportunity in Arizona. So I was still grateful to the organization and grateful to Coach Coughlin on how they handled it, even though it wasn't fair or, you know, I, I didn't like it or, or didn't deserve maybe to be benched at that time. Um, I was still grateful for that opportunity that the Giants gave me. A couple more minutes left with you, Kurt, and before we move on to something else, what did Coughlin say to you when you came off the field and told him that prior to his press conference after the game in Baltimore? What did he say to you? Uh, yeah, I don't remember his exact comments. Um, you know, I, I don't think he was thinking about that. I think he was wrestling with – that idea on, okay, what's best, you know, to move forward here the rest of the season? Because you got to remember that year in New York, um, it was Coach Coughlin's first year. He was under a lot of scrutiny. There was a lot of dissension in the ranks, not just because of this decision, but because of other things that, that he brought, um, you know, to the team. So there was a lot of dissension uh, on that team. Okay. And there was a lot of speculation that, man, he might be one and done in New York. So there was a lot of things going on. And so I could see kind of, you know, his wheels turning a little bit on, okay, what do I, what do I do now? You know, I made this move and now this just happened. And, and what's the best thing for, for everybody involved in, in my situation moving forward. So I don't remember exactly what he said, um, but he heard me. And, you know, I could tell you some other stories about Coach Coughlin and, and the respect I have for him and his ability to learn and listen, uh, even at that stage in his, uh, in his career, is pretty impressive. And so what I think happened was he was thinking about a lot of things. When I told him that, he heard that. And in hearing that and understanding how that, you know, connected to his decision, he went out and made that statement 
um, and the team moved forward. And we all know he ultimately was beloved in that organization and what he did and, and all of that stuff. But some of those critical decisions early on, he was open to listening and understanding what I was saying. Um, and he took it to heart, and uh, I think that was ultimately what allowed him to have so much success in New York. Kurt Warner here on the Rich Eisen Show. Let's uh, let's just turn the page then um, and look forward. You, you you watched a ton of Tua tape preparing for the draft a couple of years ago, uh, you know, earlier, obviously, this year. Um, so you've been watching him. What do you think he brings to the equation? What do you think the offense has looked like with Fitz that he can now bring and take maybe to another level? What do you think? Well, I mean, Fitz has been doing a great job these last few weeks at, at seeing things, getting the ball out of his hands, um, you know, just gripping it and ripping it when he sees it. And, and I think that's going to be key for Tua is uh, he's got to see it and get the ball out of his hands, all things that he was really good at in college. You know, he got the ball out quick. He made quick decisions. He was accurate with the football. All that stuff was key in his, his college success. He's got to do that in the NFL. The one thing is I know we automatically um, kind of connect him to Russell Wilson because of the size and, and some of those things. But he's not the athlete that Russell Wilson is, at least in my opinion, what I saw in college. So he can't try to prolong things, you know, with his injury history and where they're at as a team. He can't try to make a play, you know, on every play. He's got to realize when he can get the ball out, when it's just a bad play, throw the ball away, live for another down as he's learning, as he's growing, and as he's getting acclimated to the NFL game. My biggest concern is still the injuries. And, you know, if he thinks that he's a good enough athlete to kind of run around and make plays, I think he's going to get beat up, and you never know how that affects a guy moving forward. So what he did in college, do that in the pros. You know, can you see things? Can you react quickly? Can you get the ball out of your hands? Um, that, to me, needs to be where this offense is and what Tua needs to do in the early stages to have success, to hold his confidence, and then maybe as much as anything, protect himself physically um, while he's trying to, to learn the game. Before I let you go, um, Kurt Warner into this Friday, and then I will see you over the weekend in game day morning, which I'm excited for. Um, the, uh, the, the film session for Daniel Jones in the coming days, watching him run free and then trip <laughs> over nothing. What's that going to be like for Daniel Jones, Kurt? Do you think? Oh, uh, you know, I think, I think there's, there's going to be two sides to it. Yes. You know, the, the first thing, like if I got out there and laughed at Daniel Jones and criticized him, uh, everybody could come back and say, dude, you couldn't run 80 yards uh, in your backyard, uh, you know, at any point in time. Yes. You know, so to me, it was a great play. It was a great run. He's not the only one that's ever done it where, you know, kind of that monkey gets on your back as, as you're running 80 yards and you're trying to get all the way to the end zone and, and you get a little off balance or you get a little fatigued and you fall, um, you fall down. I think the saving grace is they scored a touchdown on that drive, um, you know, whereas – probably would have got beat up a little bit more. But I just, to me, it was just impressive watching him run and watching him outrun all those guys for as long as he did. Um, but, yeah, there's no doubt there's going to be some laughing and some jokes in the locker room um, and probably at practice every time he tucks and runs moving forward. But, you know, Rich, sometimes you've got to be able to laugh at yourself and move forward. But it was still an 80-yard run, which yes. is – pretty impressive and not many guys not many quarterbacks will ever finish their career saying i had an 80 yard run it's just one of those you had an 80 yard run and you didn't score a touchdown you know you had a 90 yard catch and didn't score a touchdown um you know that's always going to be a part of the, the you know the deal do you know what your longest run of your career was kurt are you do you know that no but probably less than 25 um you know what it, it's it price is right rules as you know for me it's closest without going over you just oh, I can't go over. You didn't know. Then I would, I would say less than that. Well, I got to tell uh, you, uh, Kurt, you you win the showcase. It's twenty three yards <laughs> in two thousand and one. Does that jog any memories of you running twenty three yards in two thousand one at all, Kurt? Absolutely not. You know, as much <laughs> as that probably should jog my memory because I probably only had two of those in my entire career. Right. Um, very very uneventful and something I do not and will not remember. Uh, my, do, my kids do remind me, so somebody tweeted last week mm -hmm. um, that Joe Flacco had a 28-yard sack. He got sacked for 28 yards. Yes, that's right. I tweeted one that time out. We had a, yes. uh, that we was, had a fourth down yes. uh, against Indy when I was with the Cardinals. 
and I was kind of trying to weave back and forth because there was early pressure and it was fourth down. I was just trying to get an opening so I could just throw it up, uh, you know, because you had to in fourth down. And I got tripped up and had a huge sack. So I, I tweeted that, or I sent that to my kids, and I said, did this beat me? And they're like, no, Dad, yours was 28 yards, too. So oh, I had a 28 yard sack, which is longer than my longest run in my career. So it's embarrassing, and my kids remind me of that all the time. And so I don't know if anybody's ever beaten that, but that's, you know, I'll take 80 yards and fall on a 10 any day over a 28-yard sack. I bet. Kurt, as you know, I root for you, and I root for your family uh, and your awesome family, your awesome wife, your awesome kids. I am a huge Cade Warner fan. Um, and, <laughs> and this weekend. This right? Saturday, I am all about the mustached kid, the walk-on who's got the C on his chest now. I am so proud of him, and I cannot root harder for Cade Warner on Saturday. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. He is uh, he's an amazing young man and pretty cool to see, you know, from walk on to captain, as you said. And, yes. Uh, he'll be out there starting uh, in the horseshoe. Uh, not sure it's the best draw for the first game of the year. No. But, hey, you got to you got to beat everybody. And uh, I'll be in my hotel room in L.A. cheering him on. Not going to be able to go to this one, but uh, be cheering him on. And so it's going to be it's fun to see him out there. And, you know, hopefully they can do some damage and help your wolves a little bit. Now, I will be on the same Zoom as you, rooting just as hard for your son. Uh, but probably I was a little less since he's not my son. I'm sure you'll be through the roof. I'm very excited for you. And again, that C on his chest means so much, uh, I'm sure, to him and you too. Congratulations on that. Thanks, Thanks so. buddy. I appreciate it. Take care of yourself, Kurt. Thanks for the call. All right, you too, man. That's Kurt Warner.